<laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome back to season two of the Inspire series. Today, I am really privileged to be joined with an expert panel of children's authors from across the globe, where we will explore the magic and power of storytelling that lies within picture books and how this power can not only increase literacy skills, but also spark the imagination and creativity in young readers. Um, so welcome, Holly from Canada, Michelle, Josh and Carolyn from Australia and Sarah from the UK. Welcome back. Hi. Hi. Hey. Hello. <laughs> Hi, everyone. And um, yeah, so this is picture books uh, have been a huge part of my life as it has everyone's, which is why I guess in this first week we are kind of going over a little bit of what we talked about in our first season, but maybe in a little bit more depth than what we did last time. If I can begin with um, the magic and power of storytelling, picture books do that in so many different ways, um, particularly with, you know, it's the combination of the text and the illustrations. Um, Sarah, if I can just start with you, because you were having a fantastic run with your book, The Heavy Bag. How do you yeah, feel it you. makes that kind of impact? Um, so picture books are incredibly special because you're absolutely right. It's the text, it's the illustrations, but it's also um, the acts around it. Um, picture books are intended for younger children, although anyone can read them for younger children, um, and to read them with an adult or with somebody else. So it really encourages um, that action, actually. So it always goes with picture books beyond the pages beyond the story beyond the words and then of course that brings up everything else that, that that we've talked about before um all the wonderful things that children get from picture books um in those early stages of learning and also understanding the world and understand who they are so actually it's there's huge meaning to picture books um which we could talk about forever because there's a lot of learning that goes on implicit explicit you know the child doesn't know th what's happening um but there's there's so much that they take from that picture book so yeah it's not just the text and the illustrations however that's obviously what brings the child in um into that story world so i just think picture books are probably sometimes underrated with the power that they actually give to the child and the audience and the adult yeah, exactly, exactly. Josh, your books, they do that. They really empower the readers. Yeah, they, look, they do. Even though they don't have a story and they, there's nothing to really, there's a flow of how the books start and then go through to the end, which is a, which is like a narrative arc, but there's no storyline to actually follow. And But I think it's the, it is what Sarah was saying is that, um, the power of the way the words marry with the illustrations and the way that engages with the kids. And the kids can, they sure they may be not young enough to really understand the words, but they can engage with the pictures. And if a parent is sitting there reading it to the child, they can then, they can hear what the words are saying and they can read what the words and marry that up together and then see the illustrations as well and see how that reinforces or sort of, adds an extra dimension to what the actual text is saying. And for me, I, I reckon there's, that's the power in that is just phenomenal. So when Sarah was saying that, you know, it's underrated. Yeah, look, it's a really good looking picture book. It's got great illustrations, it's magic. And an adult would look at it and go, yeah, that looks fantastic. I want my child to read that. But the actual, the, the stuff that's happening underneath, when the kids are reading it with their parents, there's a lot more going on there. And, and I think, and as you look at, you know, you can, you can say to an adult an adult who goes, what was one of your favourite picture books as a kid? They'll be able to name it straight away because it leaves a lasting impression of how the whole dynamic works together to create that sort of that thing in the child. So Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Michelle, can you comment on that? I know Absolutely. you can. <laughs> of course I can. I can talk underwater about this. What are you talking about? Um, I think one of the things that we need to 
be aware of and to put picture books in context is that the picture book as it exists today is a modern thing. So when you're talking about like my grandmother's generation, most of the storytelling for kids was still oral storytelling. So it was still listening to stories on the radio. The type of books that they were given as children were very rarely books that they would read as a child. They were like storybooks, nursery rhymes, um, but they there wasn't any such thing as a picture book. So it's probably... I guess my generation is the first generation who grew up with picture books and have those amazing, wonderful memories. And it's, what have you got there, Josh? I can see. I I have have got this. This is a picture book that I was given by my grandmother Mm. when I was about five. Okay. Now it's not a book a parent would read to a child. No. It is a book that a kid reads. (laughs) And even Spike Milligan. Has has yes. has got stuff wow. in this in this book here, <laughs> yes. but it is it is called Rhyme Giggles and Nonsense Giggles, collected by William Cole, and the illustrator is by Tommy Unger. Unger. I'm, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that right. Okay. Yes, but as you said, yeah, some of them it's just it's not something a parent would read to a child or something. It's not like that. It's a no. it's a modern thing, isn't it? It is. Yeah. So this is a this is a picture book from 1914 that belonged to my great great grandfather actually. Wow. So wow. it was it's beautiful. I've got I've like I'm a such a collector of books. So so this what we call a picture book or what we think of when we think of like modern picture books it's it's really something that's actually come about when parents now have more time to spend with their kids kids and it, it's really I, I don't want to say that it's a marketing thing because I don't think it actually um I don't think it actually came out of a marketing it actually was driven by creators so when we think of some of the first creators of picture books how we think of them today it's Peter Rabbit um it's you yeah. know it's 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 all where of the those, wild things are moral the, sending. all yeah. of those yeah. things creator Mm. driven and that's Mm. what I love about picture books so much it's very much driven by the people who are creating it and there's something that has always been very reader focused as well so it's also they've been really adaptable so it's something that has changed over time to suit modern kids or a modern readership and I think that that's the power of picture books there really is something that um is is quite fluid and it's something that um, has a story to tell. And they're always almost like a little bit of a snapshot of, of the time that they were created. And, and you can you can go back and look at all of the different books for kids over the different times. And it actually teaches you a lot about community and family and story at that time in history. I just think they're fascinating. <laughs> Holly, do you have a favourite? Do you have any books that have been handed down to you? You know, I actually don't. Um, there's, I definitely remember many that I read as a child. And I think the the thing that, that I always reflect back on is how, um, how much... It, they they had an impact on me and the what was underlying a lot of times what the like how perceptive children are I I'm just so interested in um in expanding the imagination like I what is in that book and what's on that page I think it is just so incredible what pe- what kids pick up from it. Like as as uh, one of you said, I forget I forget who said it. The when the parent is reading it, you know you, the the parent is seeing it from one point of view. But I'm I know when I was reading to my kids, I was always surprised at what they said about it. Not yeah. Sometimes it was that little detail that that I hadn't noticed. Mm. Yeah, kids are definitely uh, perceptive, aren't they, and and see things from a very different viewpoint to what we do as adults, yeah. Karen, 
you have just recently had uh, a relaunch of Home. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, I mean, I, I guess I know the background to Home and what went into it. Um, just thinking about the theme, the theme of picture books, like Home is very specific. Um, yes. Do you want to tell us about that a little bit? Um, well, if you look at our world today compared to the past, um, with the internet, there's so many areas of interest and there's also a level of education now that has expanded the way people think. And so you may have only had a few picture books in the past, but now you have hundreds and they can be about anything and they can target anything and you'll have board books and then you'll have ones for younger children and you'll have picture books for older children and then you have picture books that appeal to younger children all the way through to adult. And it could even be a coffee table book. And the interest in picture books too doesn't just come from the parents wanting to create a bond with the child but it also comes from an educational point of view because they've now realized that if you read to a child um, you increase their vocabulary by so much by the time they're five if you read every day it's something like 5,800 words or something so you might say the topic of home is not relevant for children um, because it's on refugees and migration and it's inspired by family history, but it develops empathy, it develops understanding, it gives a story a voice and anybody can understand losing a home, finding a new one and not forgetting the old one. And so the medium I chose was picture book because that's what I love, but it actually is more than what I love. It gave, it, it's the power of the story because it allows the visual to go with the words. And the picture book is the only format that does that. And when you combine them, the power of a story can be magnified Whereas if you're just reading a junior novel or a middle grade or an adult, it's totally left to the reader to put it in. But what the illustrator does is they bring in more narrative and more visual layers so that the reader gets actually more than the words. So the power of the story is just magnified so much. And mm -hmm. I think that's why... Um, home has the impact it does because the first thing you see is the illustrations and you're drawn by that sorrow and the house in the hands and I wonder what happened before you even start. So it's not just that picture books are a good thing and it's a good thing to do. You can create a social bond. It's the fact that a picture book has a power that no other book does in its format, I don't think. And it's because you have two creators combined and the other stories don't. They just have the one. And I guess in home the... The sorrow, the pain, the love, the strength, the resilience, it doesn't have to come out by me saying that. I show it with the words, but it comes out in the illustrations. They show it. Yeah. And the picture books show us things, don't tell us things. And there's a lot, a lot of power in that. And that allows a child to fill in their own gaps and make their own conclusions and develop their own understanding. It may not be what the writer intended or the illustrator intended, but it's the child's own interpretation. Mm -hmm. And what it they sparks that curiosity, doesn't it? The... Yeah. And yeah. pictures have layers and they have depth. One young child won't take what an older child will from a picture book. 
they'll go, oh, they lost their house and it's sad and I'm glad they've got a new home. A younger child, you can read it too. But an older child will get those deeper layers because picture books have all those layers. Yeah. Do mm-hmm. you find and that, Sarah, with... sorry, Karen. Yeah. Um, Sarah, do you find that, go. yeah, you got home. Yeah. 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 With your heavy bag, you have those layers too, don't you, in, in your story, in your picture book? Oh, have we lost she... Sarah? I think we have. I think well, we have. She hasn't moved Sarah. for a very long time. <laughs> Maybe she's the, the mummy from England. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, while, she, she's back. While we, while we get Sarah back, I just want to sort of pick up a point that Karen was saying. And I I think back to when I was a kid and I loved Richard's scary books. And they were the the Wily Worm and, and all that. And like, what do people do every day? And sure, there was the text and there was very minimal text in it, but it was the activities of what the illustrations were doing. I could be absorbed in that all day long, looking at the illustrations and all that sort of stuff. And, and um my phone's ringing. I don't. I, no one rings me at this point in time in the evening. So we'll just keep on going. Sarah's back. Yay! I'm back. <laughs> Hi. We can edit that bit. That's okay. <laughs> it's okay. It happens. Yeah, Sorry. Fine. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's true, Josh. That's where the creativity and the imagination and the curiosity of a child. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, it, and 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 yeah. the illustrator can make a child go deeper into a, a book than just the text would. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's it's probably worth noting that obviously you can have wordless picture books, and that just shows exactly how powerful the pictures are, um, because you know to to have that picture book out there and it tell a story and and have a narrative through pictures only that that just that just cements mm. what we're all saying here I think yeah yeah exactly um a topic that was quite controversial in the first series in, in the comments that I got afterwards was rhyme versus narrative yeah in picture books do you have any thoughts on that Holly yes no what's your favorite you know, I guess personally, my favorite is rhyme, but um, you know, I guess I like. I I I guess I I always relate to what were favorites in in my own family, and I always found that that rhyme was a favorite. But I mean, it it definitely is um, can be more. It, it can be more challenging to write as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Michelle, rhyme or narrative? Well, it's not a crime to rhyme. It's not a crime to rhyme. <laughs> um, it's not. It, but I think um, that is why a lot of uh, authors who love writing in rhyme are going down the independently publishing pathway because it's a business decision for traditional yeah. publishers. A lot of the bigger publishers, when they're having to translate the books into Korean and French and um, all the other languages, it just doesn't make sense. So they just can't. And I think that's why as an author, it's really important that you choose um, your pathway to publication really carefully and choose who you're submitting your manuscript to in the first place because there's no point sending a rhyming manuscript to a publisher who does not publish rhyming books and there are a lot of publishers out there who do not publish Mm. books in rhyme does that yeah absolutely a lot yeah yeah does that mean that you shouldn't write in rhyme absolutely not it just means that your pathway to getting that book out there is going to be different than somebody who writes in prose um it might mean that you can even look at a a smaller uh, publisher who doesn't have that international distribution who's not so worried uh, about having that as as something that needs to go into consideration but absolutely i mean my I've got um, two books 
coming out still at the end of the year. One is a rhyming book, which I'm independently publishing, and one is a non-rhyming book, which I am traditionally publishing. So sometimes I think as an author, um, you need to make a decision based on the story and and really honour the story. And if if it's a story that needs to be told, like the one that I just knew, it it just works. You know what? You, you know when you write a story and you write it in rhyme and you go, it just can't not be in rhyme. It has to be in rhyme. It just yeah. works. It's just, yeah. it, that's yeah. just yeah. the story. Yeah. Like, yeah. Well, am I yeah. not going to go ahead and publish that just because I know a big publisher is not going to do it? And no, I'm going yeah. to do that myself. Yeah. But then yeah. another story that I know is a perfect fit for a larger traditional publisher. Um, and, you know, I've I've actually received a lot of flack in my career if you want to call it a career because I do publish with lots of different publishers but I think if you want to have any sort of longevity as a picture book author which I'm predominantly like even though I'm branching out now um, you need to publish across different not only publishers but also different platforms you need to some independent some traditional some online like we did with um daisy lane publishing where we have some as animation like just honor the story and i think especially when it comes to picture books uh it's that it's not just about you wanting to be um published most of the time you're writing for a purpose and you're writing because you think that your story can really help kids in some way or other whether it be entertaining or or healing or helping um so yeah I think you're driven um and you owe it to the story just find the best pathway to get it out there that was a very long-winded I'm so sorry that was a very long-winded answer but no it's it's not a crime to rhyme (laughs) no it's not Josh your thoughts rhyme or Um, code oh look my personal thoughts I can't rhyme for the life of me I just I'll end up just roses are red, violets are blue, and cows are pink. I just that's that's about as good as I get. But if it's done really well, I mean, I think I think rhyme is something that it's a craft. And when you when it's done really well, you don't actually notice it. All you mm-hmm. notice is the rhythm and the pace and all that sort of stuff. It's like yeah. you forget that every song you hear on the radio, it's all rhyme. Every mm-hmm. pop song is all rhyming songs. Mm-hmm. Like it's like mm-hmm. you forget that. And so when you yeah. read picture books. A lot of them rhyme, some of them don't, but it, when they do rhyme, it just has a nice pace, has a nice rhythm. So for me, it's got to be well done well, yeah. but I don't rhyme because I can't rhyme. I'm terrible. <laughs> That's a really good point. I forgot to say, putting my editor hat on now, a lot of people write a poem. And they think that's a picture book. It's not. Oh, it's, no, it, no. it's two different things. Like if you write a yeah. poem and you go, oh, oh, I woke up at two o'clock in the morning and write a poem and now I'm going to get it published to be a famous author. So stop, 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 stop. Um, because a poem is lovely and precious and beautiful but a picture book has to have exactly like Karen said it has to have the next layer which is the illustration so you're you have to give your illustrator enough to be able to illustrate different things across a 32 page picture book so writing a poem is great but just because you've write a poem doesn't mean you've written a rhyming picture book getting down off my soapbox (laughs) nothing Sarah how about for you rhyme or prose yeah Definitely prose for me, but I I absolutely you know agree with one here. When I read um, rhyming picture books with my seven year old, um, I just absolutely love them, and I often forget you know that there is that rhyme in there, but she doesn't, and it's actually helped her with her reading because if you know at the moment we're kind of reading all sorts of rhyming books, and they're sticking in her mind, you know, the rhyme, the patterns, it's all there. So then the next night when we get it out, she says, mummy, I'll read it. And I can just see her confidence growing. So I I can absolutely see why, you know, why rhyme is there. I absolutely take my hat off to people that can rhyme. I've occasionally put rhyme into a prose, which is a big no-no, but you know, as Michelle said, I went down a different platform and I self-published that myself because there was a very specific message that I wanted um, to kind of stand out. So that was kind of more of a creative feature. But generally, I absolutely get it, you know, that publishers, if they're thinking about translating that book, if it rhymes, 
it really puts them off. It can be done. It absolutely can be done, but it's just something that they don't really want to touch. So, um, yeah, it's if if rhymes your thing, do it. Don't force it one way or the other. Never force yourself into prose or force yourself into rhyming. Go with what works for you because you want to do your story justice at the end of the day. Yeah, I loved rhyme when I was teaching because you can just see the literacy skills and the development, the language development that happens within the child when they get that rhyme and they can see those patterns. And Karen, do you agree? Yes, I'm a prose person and I do put rhyme in as well in my prose. Yeah. but rhyme when it's it has to be done well. Um, and then when it is done well, it works beautifully. But if you're finding a word to fit in a story to make the rhyme work, you destroy mm-hmm. the story. It's gotta be the other way around, or you you can be limiting and narrowing the story by trying to force a rhyme to match. So you've got to be really good at it. Um and you've also got to know who, if you write in rhyme, you've got to know who to send the rhyme to. You don't just send it to someone who doesn't want rhyme. Um, publishers, different publishers like different things. And there's also a, there's also um, literary picture books and then there's commercial picture books. And I think often the rhyming ones seem to be more... Um, when they're successful, they are quite commercial. Um, Julia Donaldson writes in rhyme, doesn't she? Mm. Yes. And she's an exception and Lindley Dodd because they're masters at it. It doesn't, their story is made more magical by the rhyme because they're so good at it. Yeah, yeah. Great conversation. And just to wrap it up, Holly, start with you. What's your favourite picture book? Oh, I, uh, oh, there's so many. I know, that's my answer. (laughs) Uh, I have to to think, I can't say, I don't know if I actually have one favourite. And that's exactly my answer because I I have so many that are favourites. Michelle, how about you? Pin Lizzie and Little Nell by David Cox. Yeah. My favourite favourite picture book of all time. I don't know if many people know about this. It was the very first author visit that I ever went to in primary school. I thought all authors were dead people. I did not know that (laughs) author was a job and that you could actually (laughs) be an author and be alive. Um, and I went and I went and I got um, my very first author signature and this changed everything for me and it's still (laughs) one of my favorite picture books to this day cool Josh okay my favorite have to be this one which is the little rhyme but I'm going to quick quickly read you a little rhyme from it this, this is 1967 okay have you ever seen the ghost of John long white bones and all the rest gone wouldn't it be chilly with no skin on? Ooh. It would be chilly. Anyway, that's, no my, set, that's my rhyming sense of humor. <laughs> that's very <laughs> clever. <laughs> Thanks for that, Josh. Sarah. Um, so mine's fake and it's it's it brings nostalgia to me. So I'm thinking back to all the Shirley Hughes who I had when I was growing up all the picture books and when I read them now with my youngest daughter it just reminds me of growing up in the 80s and actually reading them with my mum so it just shows that kind of long um, gravity of how that nostalgia stays with you so definitely Shirley Hughes um, for picture books at at the moment I've been introduced to so many by my seven-year-old one that really sticks out to me and I've lost my train of thought of who the author is but it it is an Australian book I think and it's called I Love You Stinky Face and for some reason we read it with an Australian accent but it's 
it's such an amazing book. It's about a child who's worried that their mum doesn't love them if they do, you know, something wrong or something doesn't go right. And it ends up with her saying, I love you, stinky face. And, you know, I'd love you if you were a monster at the bottom of the swamp. I would just come and hug you. And if if, if you were a crocodile, I would just come and clean those sharp teeth of yours. And I read that to my daughter and it's such a lovely, lovely, lovely book. I will look up the name of the author, but, but it is Australian, I think. Okay, cool. Karen? Um, I guess I have a mix of favourites because you have the perennials, the ones that have been around, like where the wild things are and we're going on a bear hunt and where the forest meets the sea and wombat stew and they're never going away on possum magic because they're so good. But then the new ones that come out, so I would say I have a favourite one all the time. One week to the next, I'll go, I love that one. I love that one. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. They all have that magic that pull you in. They do. They certainly do. So oh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Holly, Michelle, Josh, Karen, and Sarah. Um, welcome. That is the, we have to cut it off. <laughs> stop now we all know we could all talk forever about um, the world of picture books but time wise we can't um, but thank you again for joining us everyone across the globe and i'll see you back again next week for week two bye <laughs>